Welcome back, everyone. Last talk in this room. Remember that after the lunch break, it will be in the gallery room. And last talk before lunch. Exactly. Which is super important. Yeah. Um, our next speaker, actually, like the timing couldn't have been better, is a really good follow-up to the previous talk in here. Um, he initially wanted to drop an F-bomb in, um, in the title of his talk. Um, we cleaned that up for the kids. Um, but as a firefighter, he can show us what to do when your project is set ablaze. So please help us in welcoming Anyan to the stage. And don't forget to submit your questions. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, hello, NeosCon. I'm super honored to speak here today. Um, yeah, and I want to talk about um, how to screw up a NEOS project and yeah, some lessons that we learn from it. Learn from the mistakes of others uh, because you can't live long enough to make them all yourself. Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, first lady of the United States, said this, and this is the reason why we are here today, uh, so that you maybe can learn from the mistakes that we at Tech Division made. I want to share some mistakes that we made uh, in over, uh, uh, we started to develop um, projects, NEOS projects in 2013 and uh, built a lot of small and larger scale projects since then. And we gathered a lot of experiences along the way, um, but we also made some mistakes um, that I want to share with you. Um, yeah, in general, I want to share mistakes in NEOS projects, um, and I want to provide some ideas or some advices on how to avoid those issues. A quick disclaimer before we start, uh, all of the topics shown are real-world examples. It's a code that we have produced, and but they have simplified and anonymized uh, for obvious reasons, I guess. <laughs> So let's have some Schadenfreude together, and yeah, in the best case, I offer to um, offer some insights in the problems. The first screw up. What's the situation that we were in? What's the context for this problem? It's a fairly old project um, with over six years um, age, and. We continuously develop features, um, build some new stuff, the customer wanted some new features, and so it's an ever-evolving project. And it got regular updates, um, so far so good. It had over 20 languages, and yeah, in general a fairly active project with around 4,000 commits. And we wanted to update to NEOS 7.3. A bit ago, so uh, NEOS 7.3 was state of the art. And in the update process, we noticed some missing child nodes. Um, I guess everyone here in this room um, has experienced um, issues with the content repository, which is all the better um, to um, get the new content repository. Some child nodes were missing, and it's unclear what the exact reason for this was. Um, probably because the authors copy and paste it between multiple languages, which um, might have caused the problem, but in general, yeah, as I said, it's a very large project with multiple editors, multiple authors, uh, so um, stuff like that happens. 
So what do you do if you um, want to fix issues in the content repository? Uh, you try a node repair. Uh, so did we. We uh, run it on our local machines and got greeted by the following uh, screen. <laughs> yeah, uh, 25,000 missing uh, default values, uh, 5,000 uh, orphan nodes, uh, which the node repair wanted to remove. Uh, 4,000 missing child nodes and 2,000 disallowed nodes. Uh, the ex exact numbers I don't know, but um, it's, it was somewhere in the order of this. So, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, it's well, it was not so great uh, day. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, how can we solve this problem, or how did we solve this problem? For the first part, the um, adding default uh, properties uh, shouldn't destroy anything. It, overall, it's a default property, so you can just add it, right? Uh, to be sure, we made some backstop tests uh, with backstop.js to um, have a um, kind of broad overview, but um, yeah, for a project in this size, I uh, think it's a quite nice way to uh, quickly see if there are major, th major things broken. Uh, so we made some backstop tests to always have a reference and to quickly compare before and after the node repair. We manually checked uh, the missing child nodes and uh, we checked the orphan nodes and fixed some of them manually. But um, in addition, we also wrote um, custom node migrations um, just to get this problem into a more manageable state and to, um, yeah, to clearly see what the problem is and uh, to decide by ourselves what um, we want to do with the orphan nodes and so on. In the end, uh, it uh, was a multi-step script um, to execute the, migration, the migrations as granularly as possible um, and to execute the node, repa node repair in multiple steps because there were also edge cases uh, involved where you can't run the node repair because the child node is missing, but the child node can't be created because the parent node is invalid and so on. Um, so, with this multi-step script, um, we managed to get the content repository in a clean state and into a manageable state again. Yeah, what uh, did we learn from this? So, first of all, don't neglect your content repository and leave it unattended for multiple years. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, this goes without saying, but uh, yeah, if there are as many uh, authors that we um, that we have had, um, yeah, you um, need to check it regularly and try to update it and um, yeah, help the authors manage it and help to keep the content repository in a clean state. Um, also consider uh, you to include the node repair into regular maintenance. Uh, I don't know if you update the project every month, uh, include the node repair task in there, and uh, yeah, try to um, be careful what uh, the node repair actually does and uh, that you don't actually uh, accidentally uh, remove any nodes that should be still there, but the customer misconfigured something or mis misused the nearest uh, system. Also consider uh, including non-destructive node repair tasks into your deployment. Uh, for example, adding new default values um, if you do this regularly and especially if you do this with every deployment where you add new default values um, there shouldn't be a problem um, if you include the node repair for add missing default values. There are also other um, node repair um, 
don't know what this is called, uh, tasks that you uh, can include, which should, uh, in theory, be non-destructive. And yeah, be mindful about the implications of a node repair. Um, as I said, it can remove nodes that are, that are still needed or um, yeah, that just somehow got lost. The next screw up, again, uh, just a little bit of context. Um, how did we get into this situation? We build an importer uh, who imports products uh, as document nodes. We are importing those products into a separate workspace um, just for reasons to, that the, the, um, the customer can review uh, the import and maybe decide, hey, um, there's a product that I don't want or stuff like that. So we import it into a separate workspace. Uh, but of course, then we need to publish these changes into the live workspace. And at least from my experience, publishing 4,000 nodes takes about four minutes, and publishing 8,000 nodes takes uh, 30 minutes. Um, so if you try to publish larger workspaces than um, 8,000 nodes, um, most likely the publish will crash because it's ru it runs into a timeout or a memory limit or stuff like that. So our solution for this problem, we built a custom command, a pub custom publishing command um, to avoid this problem. And um, here is a dummy implementation how something like that um, might look. It's uh, fairly simple. So we just get the source workspace, the target works, uh, the, yeah, the target work workspace. In this case, it's the live workspace, and um, we get all of the unpublished nodes um, for the source workspace, and then we just simply split this command um, by a, the, the simply split this array by a limit, uh, which we can provide to this function, um, and with that. Um, you can avoid the scaling issues of larger um, publishing commands. Uh, what have we learned from this? It seems like that publishing scales with, with big O of n squared. Um, I'm not exactly sure, maybe some uh, more clever people than I, um, uh, that I am can tell me why this is the case. But um, I've looked at the code, and it seems like that Neos collects all, no collect all nodes which needed to be pub published, and then iterates over all nodes and gets all child nodes for this node that also need to be published, um, which, yeah, in the worst case, um, can scale to big O of n squared. So. Um, the larger the amount of nodes that you want to publish, uh, the slower the command gets overall um, until a point where the uh, whole command just crashes. But uh, again, I'm not totally sure about this. Um, so maybe it was just a problem in our code base and we did some weird um, stuff that, <laughs> that, uh, that caused this problem. Um, maybe instruct your customer to keep changes inside a workspace relatively small. Um, a few thousand nodes should be fine, but anything larger than that um, might cause problems. Um, if the customer decided he wants to change 20,000 nodes, um, then you might consider uh, to publish the workspace in the CLI, so just tell your customer, hey, if you have 20,000 nodes that needed to be published, just give us a quick call and we will publish them from the, th from the CLI um, and just use the limit command that I uh, showed you earlier and run it like 10 times or depending on how much nodes you need to publish. The next screw up, again, a little bit of context, um, how we got into this situation. 
Um, imagine you have a multi-site project. I have, uh, I did come up, up with two very creative names, uh, site A and site B. Um, and you want to configure a key for an API or some other configuration um, which differs between the two sites. So you create a configuration in the first site package, you create a configuration in the second site package, um, again, very secure API keys, um, and then you want to read this configuration somewhere. In this case, we, uh, for the demo purposes, we want to read this uh, configuration inside our Fusion code. So the naive approach or the naive assumption would be that because you have configured it for one side and for the other side, that the conf configuration is dependent on the side that you are. But actually, this isn't the case, and instead, um, both of the um, sites get the same value, and they get the same value depending on which plugin gets loaded last. So this is a problem um, where we have seen a lot of, especially new um, Neos uh, developers, um, where they stumble up upon this. Yeah. You expect that the configuration is dependent on the site, but as I said, this isn't the case. So what get, gets loaded last will be applied to both sides. So um, how do we usually solve this problem? We uh, create, it's just an arbitrary name, um, we create site-specific configuration. Uh, as you can see, we have this uh, site-specific configurations and specify which site and then again uh, the same configuration as before and for the other side as well. And um, we then just simply um, manipulate or extend the configuration value that we want to get um, with the uh, current site node name. It's just uh, maybe it's a workaround, um, but um, I think that it's in this way is quite clear where this configuration is coming from. Uh, either if you look into the uh, configuration and you see, okay, we have some site-specific configurations, but also if you look into your Fusion code, you also see that the, um, the configuration is dependent on the current node name. It doesn't need to be the node name, it can be whatever you decide that the key for this site-specific configuration uh, needs to be, but um, in this case, it's an example how we sometimes do it if we run into this problem. And if you do it this way, um, the configuration gets loaded correctly, uh, depending on which side you are, and you get the correct super secret API key for your very important plugin. What have you learned from this? Um, yeah, well, as I uh, told already, the configuration will be merged completely and isn't site specific, and Maybe you can consider in writing a custom eel helper, uh, which does all of the uh, um, abstraction that I showed you. Um, and in this eel helper, you also could um, include some fallbacks to the default configuration or stuff like that. You even can, um, can abstract the logic of getting the current site node name or stuff like that. The next screw up. Again, a little bit um, about the situation, about the context. We all know this. Um, there are reoccurring use cases where you might want to build a plugin, a plugin that you want to reuse across multiple projects. Um, so, for example, in almost every project, you need some sort of a slider or a carousel. Um, so, the 
approach is to build a plugin for that or to use a other plugin, but for this uh, purpose, we um, decided to build a plugin for a slider. But now the problem is that every customer wants a slightly different variation of a slider. And this eventually results in overriding almost the whole plugin in each customer just to um, cover all the use cases, all the super special use cases of your customers um, in the plugin. So you have plugins, but you override half of the plugin or the whole plugin. So what's the point of the plugin anymore? A solution uh, that we are trying to establish, uh, at least in our own plugins, that plugins don't get a concrete rendering implementation. So you have a plugin and it has all of the pre-configured configurations, it has um, some logic that is abstracted in the project, but the plugin itself is not standalone. Um, the plugin itself cannot render anything. A good example for this is uh, the lightweight elastic search uh, from Sandstorm by Sebastian. Um, this plugin doesn't provide any rendering, but it provides a small snippet, um, a small getting started, um, which then is intended to be copied into the project. So you read the README and there is a snippet and you just copy the snippet into your project and then you can do whatever you want with the rendering, but you don't have to overwrite the original plugin. Therefore, it's completely up to the project um, how they want to implement the rendering. And yeah, a plugin comes more manageable and more um, becomes better to maintain. And what also helps is to define a clear API infusion, define clear values uh, that are intended to be overwritten or that are intended to be uh, changed by the implementation or by the by the uh, project that is using the plugin and define values that are not intended to be changed or should be avoided to be changed and overwritten. So in general, be mindful about um, the extent of rendering in plugins. Um, consider what uh, this plugin needs to do and especially consider the need for customization. Um, think um, what might be some use cases where this plugin is needed and then decide, okay, the use cases might vary so much between the, uh, between the projects um, that you decide to don't include any rendering in the plugin at all or only small parts that are likely always to be the same. The next screw up. Uh, who of you has seen a configuration folder that looks like this? It goes on and goes on and goes on. <laughs> so quite a few. Um, yeah, especially in long lasting projects of ours, um, which have been updated since very old versions of NEOS and have accumulated countless node types over the years because yeah, as it should be, the customer always wants new, fe new features and want to, wants to extend the project. So over the years it accumulates a lot of node types and in the worst case all of the node types, all of the configuration is, one, is in one single configuration folder where we have in the end 200 node types or even more. And yeah, this becomes increasingly cluttered and very confusing and hard to maintain. Um, so how can you approach this problem? Um, 
first of all check if there are unused node types. I think there are plugins for that where you can see the usage um, of a specific node types. So check if there are unused node types and uh, remove them. If you don't have to maintain this code anymore because it's unused, remove it and it's not a problem anymore. Also consider splitting uh, the configurations and splitting your code into multiple packages. Group them into single, um, group them into similar functionalities like um, you can have a package where all of your form stuff is in, you can have a package where all of your search stuff is in, you maybe have a package where you have a specialized um, super um, complicated rendering plugin for hotspots on an image with a slider over it and so on. And use the new, it's not so new anymore, um, but I've seen uh, a lot of projects that still don't use this feature. Uh, use the new feature to organize node types into subfolders. You can look it up in the documentation how this works, but you can um, split um, the configurations in node type folders and then uh, split it further and therefore um, it becomes more manageable and way easier to maintain. So what have we learned from this? Take your time to restructure uh, your code and oftentimes um, it's well worth the effort and it's most of the time um, quite easy and painless to split the code into multiple packages. Of course, there are also other examples where this is very hard and you sit there for days and then decide, okay, scrap it. Uh, <laughs> we will never manage to refactor this code. But uh, in the most cases, um, I think it's quite easy and painless. But you uh, get a code base that is easier to understand and you can also maintain uh, your project better and include new features uh, more easy and also or especially for new uh, developers or for new members for this project uh, it's way easier to see okay what's this project about okay there's a there's a package who um, which uh, just uh, uses the node types and a, a package which just handles the forms and there's a package which just handles uh, search and i don't care about this right now so i just look into this package where the super special hotspots um, thing is rendered because i need to fix up a, a bug in there So, uh, that's all about my talk. Um, I would love to hear uh, some stories uh, how you might have uh, screwed up a project or some lessons that you have learned. Um, feel free uh, to talk to me, uh, especially now in lunch. And that's all from me. Thank you so much, Anyan. We do have a couple questions that came in. Um, when you were talking about your creatively named Site 8 and Site B, um, someone asked, have you considered flow subcontext to handle site-specific configurations? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> They're full of good questions, these people. Yeah. Um, I actually don't have a, a well-defined well opinion about that. Um, I'm sure we can discuss this, um, what's <laughs> what you exactly want to achieve. But um, if you build a custom eel helper for that, um, you, can, um, you can make it whatever you want. So um, decide uh, what's your use case and decide um, what you want to achieve and then maybe extend your custom view helper that you've built. So whoever asked this question, don't be shy. Step up to Anyan. Fight it out. So 
how do you solve site-specific configuration with keys or data from environment variables? Um, so first of all, um, environment variables, um, I've seen them in some projects, but um, most of the time I think that they are not really necessary because you have the, um, as said, you have the context-specific configurations that you can set for a context. If you have a development environment, you can set the, um, the uh, configuration that you need for a development environment. And if you have a production environment, you can set the production API keys and stuff like that. So um, I would make the argument that uh, uh, environment variables aren't really uh, needed, or at least we don't use them in our projects. OK. When implementing plugins, have you explored implementing functionality using augmenters and configurable attri attributes with sane defaults? Yes, it's a very good idea. Um, there's a plugin by um, Sandstorm, is there? Um, which also uh, uses um, or extends the, the functionality of fusion components. Um, we might want to look into this, uh, but for now, um, we, we just use um, the, the plain fusion um, configurations. Um, yeah, so it's a good idea, and um, yeah, maybe we can try it. And the last question is juicy. Christian? Yeah, indeed. Is there any uh, screw up that you never managed to fix? Oh. <laughs> Don't expose yourself if you don't want to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking about of all of the issues that we had over the last years. Yeah, of course, um, a perfect example is that you have uh, r really, really old projects uh, where the customer never wants to pay for an update and it just runs forever. And then you end up with uh, Neos uh, 3.1 uh, and then the customer says, hey, now we need this new feature, and um, uh, yeah, this uh, most of the time is a case where yeah, it's a lost case, um, or it can be a lost case to update such old projects. But it also can work out. But we had some projects where we decided, okay, this is so old, we won't maintain this anymore. Uh, we just scrap it and write it new. But wouldn't scrapping it kind of also solve the problem? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Scrapping the whole uh, the whole uh, project is also solving the problem. I'm trying to help problem. you out by saying there's no problem you haven't ever not fixed. Deleting the whole project uh, is solving the project. 